I'm going to read about 41 verses, so. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished saying, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear each one of us in his own native language? Parthians and uh, Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia and Ferga and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes. Christians and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others, mocking, said, they're filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's the only th the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I shall show wonders in the heavens above and signs in the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh will also dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life, and you will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would, let, he would set one of his descendants on his throne. He foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ that he was not abandoned to Hades nor did his flesh See corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but He Himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now, when they heard this, 
They were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and your children and for all who are far off. Everyone whom the Lord calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized. And there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Pentecost is the birthday of the church. Pentecost is the birthday of the church. After 10 days of prayer, united prayer, the disciples are receiving the promise, filled with the Holy Spirit in a, it's a miracle of language. As they begin proclaiming the mighty works of God in languages they hadn't known seconds earlier. A reversal of Babel, we often call it. Now in this scene, the tongues they were speaking, these are known languages, even dialects. If you look in the Greek, he's actually, it was actually, they're even dialects because you, you speak differently in different parts, even in the same language. And this is, I don't know, 2,000 years before Google Translate, which <laughs> ain't got nothing on the Holy Spirit because it's like instant and perfect, right? And the reason for this is to spread, even there in that place, begin to spread the message to all the nations and reap a harvest of souls because it had begun. And not coincidentally, this is, Pentecost is the festival of harvest or weeks. And that's celebrating the covenant given at, at, at Sinai after Israel is uh, delivered from Egypt. 50 days after the feast of first fruits. So here are 50 days. You have the 40, Jesus ascends, another 10. 50 days after Christ, who is the first fruit from the dead. The ultimate sacrifice. Here we have the harvest of the nations begin. And we can see this from the scene. Dwelling there in Jerusalem, there were Jews. And they were devout men from every nation under heaven. They were dispersed, so they're, they're coming. They're coming on this great pilgrimage, like probably none of us have ever, ever really seen. And it is the perfect opportunity. Actually, it is the only, you know, perfect opportunity that was set up for this to happen. And exactly how the church was birthed. Because it would have taken a lifetime to learn languages and spread the gospel without a miracle. And it only took moments. And weirdly enough, they called them drunk because they were speaking and learned languages. Usually when you get drunk, you get stupider. <laughs> and, and they're getting smarter. But that's all they had. That's all they could explain. They, they had no other explanation for it. It must be some mystical alcohol. I don't know. So Peter stands up and preaches. He uses scripture that they know to point them to the Messiah. And out of all the things to say, he tells them, and you're the ones who killed him. You're responsible. What greater sin can any of us imagine than killing the Son of God? Or being, just being accused of it.
And instead of retaliating, which you would have expected, right? Like, what? Who are you to say that we, what? No. Instead of retaliation, because of the work of the Spirit, conviction came. Conviction came for these devout Jewish pilgrims gathered by the thousands. They were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, in this this moment of guilt and shame, what are we supposed to do? What can we do? And Peter, he responds with the same thing that any of us must do this morning in our lives. When the Holy Spirit cuts our hearts, meaning you feel the, that guilt and that, that shame, what we have to do is the same thing, and that's repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So the, the people who killed Jesus... I think this is incredible. There's some of the first to be reached by the the grace of God. That's amazing. I mean, isn't that an unforgivable sin? If you had any part in it, right? Apparently not. Obviously not. And we think we've done bad things in the past. So, What they had to do, what do we have to do to be saved? What did they have to do? Was was it that all they had to do was just simply believe that the Messiah was real? At that point, they're already believing that the Messiah is the Messiah. And the question is, is, is what must we do? There's this moment happening in it's, we define it, we try to make our own ways to explain it, to answer the question, but the Bible clearly tells us how this happens. First of all, we can't do anything to earn our salvation, right? Uh, obviously not. Nothing we can do. But there are things that we must do There are things that we must partake of, enter into, and express in our hearts in order to respond to the grace of God that is so abundant even today. And the first thing is, I'm going to use a letter because I'll use A. You have an A and B and then you have three, probably some points in there, but hopefully you only just remember one this morning. The first one is repent. Repent, repent. Oh, we don't like that word. Such an archaic word. Makes you think of turn and burn, right? You better repent or you're going to hell. That kind of thing. Well, in a way, that's true. Um, Luke 13, 3 says, No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So I guess Luke's saying that soft, softer, right? You're going to perish if you don't repent. But it's true. But what is repentance? And usually we think of it as a feeling of remorse, right? Like feeling, you feel bad for your sins. You feel bad for things that you've done. But that's not repentance at all. We can feel remorse all day long. You can feel bad about doing things all week long. In fact, your entire life. And you can never repent. You can still never repent and still feel bad. So when the Jewish pilgrims, hearing that they crucified the Messiah, and they're responsible, when they experience that feeling bad, that, that, that remorse, as we call it, that, the words for cut to the heart in the Greek, that's your remorse right there. So that's going to be separate from what Peter tells him to do. 
Now, it helps lead to repentance, but it's just a helper. Here's what repentance means. Maybe a new definition for you. I don't know. It means a change of allegiance. Repentance is a change of allegiance. Feeling sorry. I mean, I, I don't know about you. I felt sorry for stuff when I was an unbeliever. And I had barely a moral compass. When we feel bad for doing something, what do we do? As humans, we try to make up for it. As, as humans, we do, right? Um, talking about dogs, what is my, my dogs, what do they do? It seems like they experience just shame or fear. You know, they, I found, I found the poop, you know? They know that I found it and they're ashamed, right? I say, Lucy, and my little mini schnauzer, Lucy, she's, she's like, her head is down. She knows that she did something wrong, but she doesn't do anything to make up for it. She's still making the same mistakes. That's why she's in the kennel right now. Um, poor thing is from a puppy mill, so she's been through trauma, but, you know, we're working on it. But she's not going to make up for it. We do this as human beings. We feel like we can make up. It's, you know, it's like I eat too many calories. Oh, no big deal. I can just make up for it by, by exercising the next day. And we get in this thing where we think good deeds can make up for where we lack. And we're going to become better people if we do enough good stuff. And we never make up for it because we're going to continue to fall short in these fallen human bodies. So it's a battle we're never going to win. So if you're trying to win that battle with good deeds and works and all that, you're never going to win. Repentance is going from that side of the battle. It's basically going from one side of that, the battle in the life that you're in and fighting the weapons that you've been fighting with your whole life and you're, you're going to lay down those weapons and you're getting off of that side, and you're going to a completely different side and picking up new weapons. That's the picture of repentance this morning. Amen. And those weapons are spiritual weapons. They're not with your own strength. In fact, you didn't even make them, or you didn't do anything to obtain them. They were given to you. So repentance, unlike the world system that we're in, and of course, religious law and, and zeal and all those things, it's not about making bad people good. It's actually about bringing dead people to life. That's what repentance is about. Now, John the Baptist came preaching this. Repent, the, the kingdom of heaven is near. Somebody's coming greater than me and... He was telling them to repent, and, and, and he was baptizing people in a baptism of repentance. But you know, the problem is, is out of that, they didn't have the equipment to live up to their repentance. There, there was something missing. And they baptized in people's names, and that showed your allegiance. Well, to be baptized into the name of John isn't going to do much. John, John was John. To be baptized into the name of Jesus is much different because Jesus is God. So it's way different. So you go from repent A and here's the B. Be baptized. So here's your baptism class. Ephesians 4.4, 4, there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. It sounds like baptism is pretty important, doesn't it? I mean, just today, if you came from whatever history, whatever background, 
Just try to forget everything you know about baptism and just hear what the Word of God says this morning. Because it sounds like just from those verses, it's going to be faith, pretty important, I'd say, and God, we have a little baptism. And I'm actually ashamed to say this. And I'm grateful you take your shame. I'm ashamed to say we have forgotten how important this is. This is difficult as this Number one, it's mercy. That's number one. That means going under the water? So what I'm saying is it's not sprinkling. I'm not saying that God is anyone who's ever been sprinkled. He's not going to accept. He's going to say, oh, no, 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 no. But this is what the Bible says. So I'm just preaching what the Bible says. There's no way that it can't be immersion. So there's, there's no way that biblical baptism can not be going under the water and then coming out. Um, here. Any time they're baptized, they're going under, they're coming out, of course, because it's, it's a burial and it's a resurrection. You're dying, coming alive. Plus, you can follow it. So it's a special argument for this. Matthew 3 16, and then, then when Jesus, when Jesus was baptized, I, I blundered there because I'm thinking, Jesus did this. Why is this so complicated? And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. So how... In the world, can we lessen something Jesus did at the start of his ministry? Not only that, he commands us to do it at the end of his ministry. Matthew 28, 19, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So, does baptizing there, is that like a... Kind of a favorite of baptizing. We just saying that when we go rich nations and immerse them in the word of God. No, we're not going to allegorize or make favor of this. this is, what he's saying to do is actually what he's saying to do. And that is to make disciples. And part of making disciples is baptizing. Immerse them. In water. But please, I'm not arguing with myself. The Bible stopped it. It's only symbolic. Just a symbol. Just a profession. Just a public, just, just a public display of faith. And as I'm speaking to you, I had to repent for my way. To lessen something that we are commanding to. That is according to the word of God. So, number one is immersion, and here we go for number two. Don't get mad, because it's biblical. It is more than a symbol. It is more than a symbol. It's involving an impartation. These are things that you can't see. It is going upon the grace of God. We do this with other things. In communion, we, we you know, we, Jesus is present with us now. We don't, of course, don't, we wouldn't believe in like transubstantiation. Um, the Catholic typically, Catholic typically believe that it's actually coming 
the body of Christ, the coming of the blood of Christ, and you'll have separate grains to grain the communion carries. You know, thinking that that's actually Jesus' blood. So I'm not, I'm not going that far, but I'm not going to let you in either and say nothing is happening. But nothing supernatural is happening. And I think scripture will prove that this morning here. If you want to write this. We are going to stick with oil. Yeah, it's, it's symbolic, but it's also sacramental. Because God uses himself. This is the God who uses, like, people's thoughts to heal people. I mean, who can say what he can or can't do? Amen. We just can't do that. So I said, say to his friends, who are you going to say that God can't do? I mean, really. Or God can't do this, or God can't do that. So it's a mercy, it's a sac- it's sacramental, it's more than a symbol. It, it has to be because, well, the word about mercy. Um, it's a mercy in our lives in Christ. I, in our conversion process. And when we're doing that, it's out of repentance, right? And we're changing allegiances, we're laying down what we we're fighting with, and we're picking up these new weapons. And you're also, at the same time, we're joining a community. We're entering into a new kingdom community. It is such a change that the scripture proves. It's such a change in us that the Bible says in baptism we are putting on Christ. Galatians 3.26, for in Christ Jesus we are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's either Jew or Greek, there's either slave or free, there's only one or female, and you're all one in Christ Jesus. There goes your divisions. And baptism has a place in that. By grace, of course, and faith. But in baptism, we're entering into sacramental. We're entering into identification with Christ's death and his resurrection. And in turn, the answer to this time. A new way of life. A new family of God. That's so only for life. For eternity. So think of it more like a supernatural initiation. Not simply, yeah, it's just a symbolic act. It's, it's just, it's just communion. If it's just communion, why? Why did Paul say that if you're not taking it in a worthy manner, some people are dying with this then? It's just, it's just a symbol. Something changes, ladies and gentlemen. And it's just from a Calvinistic back. I, I understand. But please turn me out. Not everything in Calvin said was wrong, but I think he was born in like 1500. So he's just a man. Okay? If you're from that kind of background, you're going to say, well, this guy, I think he's searching that. Is he saying a work can earn our salvation? Because I don't agree with that. When I say about works, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. There's nothing you can do to earn salvation. So that that part, I don't agree with all of it, but that part of what Calvin said, understand that people take it too far. Baptism, that I'm probably going to say multiple times, just so I'm clear, is not the earning of salvation by a work. That is, it's impossible to do that. It is God working in you within the conversion process. It's God's work in you, and you're participating in it, physically. 
Receiving a gift is never really anyway. I mean, it's a gift to somebody to But you have to receive it. You stretch out your hand to take a gift. You're doing something that must be work. No? Not at all. Um, what, what's your name called? Does someone tell us? Name called? Give me someone. Seven Michelle. Seven Michelle? Pull your sword. Pull your sword. Who wants to send it? Pull your sword. I mean, everything's original. Mint. It's probably like worth $100,000. I go and I, I find someone to build this car. I fund it. They build it. It's the perfection exactly as it came off the lots. What kind of? Sunglasses. Real cool. Um, so I get this exact man. It's an expensive color because you can't get cars like that anymore. I pay for it. I'm fun with it. And I go to the court and say, "Hey, this is yours." I pay for it. I come in. I'm, I'm there. So here's the keys. The only thing they have to do, uh, see so if they have to sign it. You have to sign it for the title. So. Uh, what would you say? The court would say, no one in the right mind would go, no, 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 I'm not signing the papers. And if I sign those papers, then I actually learned that wrong. That sums up, right? Absolutely. Does. Because signing it somehow would make it work, that would be ridiculous. I'm the one who paid for it, not for it. I heard it. I work for it. So, in this way, Baptism does not learn salvation, but it's part of the process. It is part of the process. Unless, unless you believe that God is just, here we go, and this is what happens. God can just save you without you doing anything. And he's going to pick half of this room to save, force them to be saved, and half of this room to force them to go to hell, and there's nothing that he can do about it. That sounds crazy. It doesn't sound like God is certain. Because it doesn't sound like the God of the Bible. Am I okay? Please. I mean, I, I, I guess I'm, I don't have to defend myself. That's not that's, 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 We're part of this. He, he gave us a free will. He gave us a heart to respond, to take the keys, to sign the papers. Now, does our response hurt? No. It's not earning the salvation. But does our response save us? Well, partly, in a way, actually, yes. Without the earning sense. Just to hear that, okay? Our problem is we think about learning so much when we hear these things, we're all the way and the way and the way and the way. That can't be true. Well, I'll start with Mark 16. 15, and he said to them, Don't tell the world and proclaim the gospel to the reason. Whoever believes in his God will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Now, some people. You know, that's just an added on part of Mark, it's in front of the Bibles, that's fine. Let's just go to the main one, verse 3 or 3, 1, 1. Baptism, which corresponds to this, and he had just been talking about Noah and how he was saved and through the ark and all that. Baptism now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body. Did you catch that? It's not the thing that is actually cleansing you, like, really? But this is what it is. As an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And there it is. That's why our scripture can say that baptism now saves you. And he explains it very well. Or we can just take this out of the Bible and ignore that. Because you're just like, no, I'm not going to say that because you're, I mean, and that's... These crazy divisions that we have. And we'll, we'll, we will crucify each other over them. You know. 
So, Peter says, this is how we're saved. Yes, we are saved through baptism. Here we are, not by cleaning our sin by magic water and our sin being flushed away. That was special sin, right? But it stands for you. It's an appeal to God. An appeal for a clean conscience. The word for appeal is, it's, it's only found in this verse of Scripture. And it tells us the reality. Here's what it means. To question, to inquire, a pledge, a profession as marking the spiritual character of the baptismal rite in contrast to mere external purification unto God as an inquiry query or a longing after God. It's a desire. It's a desire, a longing for salvation. Do you know what that sounds like? It sounds like a prayer. Because that's what it is. But that's the main thing we need to take out for this design. Oh, it helps so much My life now. That's the picture how we go through the salvation process. For us in Western Christianity, I'll say, and many, many times, I think it's over in the how do, we go, how do we go about talking to someone about the salvation process? Like, what are you going to say? What are you going to say? What do we do? What do we say? It's usually associated with a certain prayer, right? Consider it's prayer. And it's interesting to me that I've done it for <coughs> over a decade. We say the sinner's prayer on some day. And we mark that as the day that we got saved. Now, I'm not saying we didn't get saved. I mean, I said it's in the day, but that's the day that we mark. And it's in the church, not even the Bible. Try to find it somewhere. The book of Acts is so clear on what people did in response to the word of God to receive the gift of salvation. They got baptized. That's what they did. But Pastor, the, the Bible says that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, we're saved right then and there. Are you adding a word to salvation? No, I'm not. I preach the word of God which I'm going to be helping out of the Lord. So, if you want to quote Romans 10 9, you should really go back and read Romans 6 30. And that's what happens when you take things out of context because you can make the Bible say whatever you want. According to whatever tradition you were raising. From the beginning of the church, the response to the gospel, the profession of faith, the enacted prayer was the baptism. That is the original sinner's prayer. And it's in action. Because God designed our bodies to do stuff. And, and that's, that's, that's something you're really going to remember. I remember being baptized in, in, in the pool in Florida. I was, I was re-baptized because the Air Force in, I don't know, 99, 2000, some, one of my Baptist roommates took me to a Baptist church and I got baptized and I had no idea what I was doing. But my papu, who has passed on an ordained minister in World War II death. I remember visiting, going underwater in the presence of my family and being baptized. So a new family. All well, my family was there. Why? Because, because God is awesome and He wants you to remember probably Baptism is the culmination of conversion, and we have proof of this. So, at Pentecost, the Samaritans in chapter 8, the Unity in chapter 8, and we're going to chapter 10, Lydia in chapter 16, Pope in January chapter 16, uh, Paul in chapter 9. So, from the start of the church, 
the enacted uh, acted out plea or sinner's prayer, the changing of allegiance from the world system to the kingdom of God is in the baptism. Act. Profession. Never did someone say, hey, bow your heads. Then we'll be after you. Then that's it. I'm not saying, like I said, remember, I'm not saying there's no validity. And it's your decision. I have just seen what the Bible says. They heard the message. Think about these about two. Think about it. Do they have time for a baptism class, ladies and gentlemen? We're on a pilgrimage on a religious pilgrimage. And now they're guilty with the weight of their sins of killing Jesus the Messiah. And they're cut to the heart. And they repent. They change allegiances on the back and they go into the water. I never see all this So I'm here to tell you, Baptist and saves just as much as our evangel- evangelistic sinners' prayers. And so the only difference is only one of them is biblical. If you want to get technical this now. Romans 6 3, here it is. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. It's the enacted prayer we're initiating into Christ and into a kingdom community. You're leaving the old behind. Are you saying you're going to be perfect? No. And I know there's some in here. You're not, you're going to hesitate. Because you think you're not perfect yet. Do you think the murdering religious Jews were perfect when they entered that water? It's the change of allegiance that works you on to perfection, which is maturity. Do you think I stopped personally having lustful thoughts before I entered into a relationship with Christ or was baptized? I mean, do we have to get perfect before we get in there? None of us are going to do that. <laughs> but we do receive forgiveness. And that forgiveness, everything you've been doing in your life, before that moment, you try to make up for it, you try other things to make up for the guilt and the loss of purpose and the loss of identity. Or the, the, the religious ways you develop that's just earning anyway. And you know, we're like, this is the time more of this. Because you could very well be religious. And not everyone changes weaknesses. Unless we have ever seen one of us go be God's thoughts. Every single one. We, we fall, when we've fallen short of his holy standard, we cannot live up to it. It's not possible in our fallen nature. And the guilt and shame, it, it just drives us to do crazy things. I remember, you know, abusing substances. Probably, I mean, a lot of it was just to stop the pain. And the guilt and the, the things that I've done, I've done to myself. And the, I put things in my body that numbs me to it. Because I was trying to make sure because I didn't know about this through it. So we, we do try to cover up the most strength, and how many of you have really succeeded at that? Make up for it, Adam and Eve, they did it from the start, I've said it before. God said, no, no, your leaders are not going to do the church. Not, not the best thing to cover yourself up with if you're saying something's going to have to die. Something is going to have to die. To provide covering for your skin. And those animal skins, I mean, they're pointing to eventually, they're pointing to Jesus right on the start. Because that's the only way. You sacrifice. Guilt, shame, removed. Man, that sounds awesome. Forgiveness in his baptism, the for the forgiveness, in identifying with him, what he did. Yeah. 
Yeah, in that sense, yeah, your, your sins are washed away. That's forgiveness. That's who you're in. And now, why do you wait, rise and be baptized, and wash away your sins? And that's for that young man. If he's here, I don't even know. Why are you waiting? Rise and be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on his name. Change allegiances. Jesus, then Jesus comes out of the water, and... For service. Descend on them. So baptism is also testing the spirit. You can't say it, it's there. The Spirit of God, of course, this is the Spirit of God that is received that salvation, right? In that process. Opening up, yes, for opening up the way for all the gifts of the Spirit. But right now we're talking about the conversion process. And that spirit that's living with you for the rest of our lives. So then the natural question is, so then can you be saved without baptism? Can I be saved without baptism? Well, I guess if I was going to answer that, rather than answer too hastily, I would say, well, can you be saved without a sister? You see what that does? So, hmm, okay. Uh, so, baptism takes the water. It's, I mean, it's like the saving waters through which Noah, you know, on the ark, right? We have this water that's going up, passing through the Red Sea, being delivered from Egypt in bondage, which, yeah, that's, that's, that's what you're doing, basically. Um, God's saving power is just using <laughs> the water, it's used in that process. To be born again. Right? To be born again. If we're born again, we should know that we're born again. Your life, I didn't say your life will be perfect, but your life should reflect it. This is how you know that I'm born again. I also know that I'm not perfect. Struggles happen. Things happen. The health of all creatures are. Sorry. It's never what it was about. It's about being born again. New birth. And we see that even in the science and the physical, right? Um, no more babies in our mother's womb. When that amniotic sac. Hey, that's the majority of that is water from the mom's body. With a whole bunch of supercharged nutrients. It's awesome. It's water. When a baby is born, what is the natural way to be born to the birth canal, right? I'm not going to go into that, but I'll answer it just in case. Um, it's good time, we're all. Um, through the birth canal. Now, can you be born without going to the birth canal? You betcha. My way has, uh, yeah, all of our fishing sets, right, Mom? Huh? Yeah. Um, uh, it's starting with an emergency. So the emergency is not the natural way, but you can be. So maybe that's the answer. Can we be born, can we be born without going to the devil? Yeah. But a C-section is not normal, and it's not necessarily healthy. I know that's the advanced. Baptism is part of the normal way of Christian conversion. That's it. Now, now it's the time. The Bible says you must be blind. And I, I know that people sign up for baptism. I know you're ready and somehow we've gotten to the thing where we call baptismal candidate standards. What makes you a candidate is that you're a sinner. You're a man to your shame and so you should sit in the story. You sit down fighting your own battles in the strength of the world, from the influence of the world, it's not going to work. You need 
a helper. You need a new allegiance. You need to be saved. And the only way to do that is to be born born again. And what has that to do with it? John chapter 2, verse 1, now there was a man of the Pharisees named Aeneas, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night. He came in shame. And he said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, and no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, truly, truly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Don't marvel that I said to you that you must be born again. Don't marvel at it. This is it. So I'll say this. With every, every head unbound and every eye open, well, I'm talking about the sunset. We're talking about and we're saying I can't say it's the rooms. Don't judge her, boy. Um, we're talking about why do we, why do we close our eyes to all of this? Is this a secret thing? That you're about to change so you can sit on the dark side to the kingdom of God? Well, remember, you're the only phenomena. I've said this to her for many times, okay? I did, and I've done it. Come up here with you guys. But why? Why is this secret? It was never a secret in the Bible. They did this and threatened each other as a community, as a family. And people's lives have changed. But the response to the gospel was a public Immersed in one of physical for everyone to see. Families, the act of out sinners around. We need to change. We are we are not tired. That's real repentance. If somebody said, Don't you on this side, you do not want to go back. Because these buttons are really powerful. We're powerful enough to let us say, I don't know, make a man who speaks to morality never have to look at morality again because he has the weapons in his school notes. To turn the alcoholic from crazy alcohol every morning to never let him know that. It's a good round of letters. Listen to all the accusing voice of the enemy in your head that you fall out so much and you're a bad parent and that this and that comes with every word. And it's silence when they come into contact with the help of salvation. Well, that's what I'm going to ask. Three thousand. I'm going to go to the center. That's like what? A third of the world town? Okay, um, don't watch. And it's around, and everyone was just single, head down, and like, oh, so imagine that. And I'm like, Lord, like, being done, I'm like, oh, I'm just single. It's not even such a bad thing. Even if today you're like, you're, you're ready, you're, you're being cut to the heart, right? That's, that's, that's a whole story. And, you 
was in a prison for 10 years. Well, he ever changed when he was in the last semester of your life. You have to change this. You have to react. And don't let the arrogance of religious pride keep you from being baptized in the world. And certainly don't let the fear of being blessed or walking out of your life. It's not the winter anymore. It's like getting on your door for a sidewalk. You drive that disgusting. Go, right over the back of the motorcycles that I'm sure are going to sign up. You want to drive real quick. But, Jesus, Jesus said instead of hiding in secret, I think they said this. Do you like, when you, when you like a lamp, do you just, you put a book over and hide it? No, you, you let it shine for the whole world to see. Well, think about that with this decision. Well, let's say it's not really a secret. I don't know if today, today today's going to be fired, or there is going to be some bad that we may somehow get a little hit, raise some money, and have a permanent baptism over here, so if people want to get saved, they can go through the process that Jesus and the apostles prescribed. And he's very public. He was a servant of the Lord. He said, You know, um, it was this eternal thing. I lost, I moved to this, and, and I came out and I saw a family that loved me. Of all nations and all pasts and all mysteries. And then we're walking through together. Repent. Change your allegiance this morning if you've never switched kingdoms I almost said just close your eyes this is hard for me keep your eyes open you want to walk in freedom don't wait for, don't, don't get the theology and all this whatever you know this side that side this is what I saw this is what I saw um, this is the way they do it this is what this is what the Bible says It's time for this church to shift perhaps from this morning, you've been in the cold, dead religious thing and you want new life and freedom in Christ this morning and your heart is burning now. You can do one thing at least before we do this, just stand to your feet. Come on, just stand up. It's, 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 we're wrapping up. Now's, 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 the, now's the heart of it all. And it's going to be enacted in the way people give their entire lives to Jesus this morning. To be baptized for the forgiveness of sins into the name of Jesus Christ and receive, yes, receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. It's a promise. God does good with promises. We don't. I promised my kid I'd help him with his Mario Legos, Lego set, and I, I didn't help him. I mean, I failed. I'm a sinner. There you go. I'll make up for it, right? It doesn't work like that with this Heavenly Father. He promises this despite what you've done, and He offers this gift this morning. Enter into the kingdom of God. So if your heart is pierced, just begin to come forward. Come on. Just begin to come forward. Anybody. It, it doesn't matter where you're coming from, how far you have, how long you've been a Christian, you know that today is the day you're, you're going to change allegiances. You can line up right here and we are just going to baptize people. And this is a community. It's a communal thing. So you can come up a little bit. You want to witness it. You want to see it. The identification the proclamation, the enacted prayer of people who this morning, they're going to leave the water serving in the kingdom for the rest of their lives. Made new, forgiven, walking as new creations. Let's worship this morning as we witness the miracle of salvation.